Please stand if you are able. Blessed be God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us say together the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Universal and unchanging God, we are one, unalterably one, with all the human race. Grant that we who share Christ's body may, through your unifying spirit, break down the walls that divide us. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of 2 Samuel. When the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of the God, the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go. 
Do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. The word of the Lord. A reading from Psalm 89. I have found David my servant. With my, my holy oil, oil have I anointed him. My hand will hold him fast. And my arm will make him strong. No enemy shall deceive him. Nor any wicked man bring him down. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those My faithfulness and love shall be with him. And he shall be victorious through my name. I shall make his dominion extend from the great sea to the river. He will say to me, you are my father. My God, at the rock of my salvation. I will make him my firstborn, and higher than the kings of the earth. I will keep my love for him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his line forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law, and do not walk according to my judgment, if they break my statutes, and do not keep my commandments, I will punish their transgressions with a rod, and their iniquities with a lash. But I will not take my love from him, nor let my faith be false. I will not break my covenant, nor change what is out of my lips. Once for all, I have sworn, sworn by my holiness. I will not lie to David. His line shall endure forever. And his throne shall endure It shall stand fast forevermore like the moon. The abiding witness. 
A reading from the book of Ephesians. Remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at the time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. Savior Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. 
Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, Jesus saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick out to, on mats and wherever he heard, to wherever he heard, they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Gracious God, may your word be spoken and may your word be heard. Amen. Please be seated. Where is God? After the Exodus, the Hebrew people associated the presence of God with the Ark of the Covenant, that special box where the Ten Commandments were laid. And it was housed inside a mobile sanctuary called the Tent of Meeting, which traveled along with them. Later, as they settled in Canaan, in a more permanent way, after King David, King Solomon built a magnificent temple in Jerusalem as a permanent home for the Ark and for it to be the place where worship and sacrifices to God were carried out. However, five centuries later, the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians and the people were carried off captive to Babylon. Where was God then? Without the temple, Jewish worship changed and focused instead on the Torah, the teaching believing that God was in the community of those who lived by the Torah. When Jesus came on the scene, he declared, the kingdom of God is very near. Yes, the presence of God is very, very close to you. Yes, you. And I'm going to tell you a big secret. Are you ready? Jesus was a body. Ooh, really? Yes, that's one of the big ideas Christians believe in, is the incarnation. That means the enfleshment, the embodiment of God in Jesus. But that is by no means the first body that God inhabited. When God made creation, They made all bodies in creation, and God put themselves in all created bodies and called them good because they contained God. Somewhere along the line, we forgot this most basic, obvious thing, that from the beginning of time, God is in bodies, even our bodies. Now, that's a problem because we don't like bodies very much, do we? We have been trained through our white Western culture to hate our bodies, which are never good enough. They're just not. We've been taught that they're just not strong enough or beautiful enough or whatever enough. We've also been taught to hate and fear other bodies, black and brown bodies especially. This all causes division and enmity between white bodies and black bodies 
between immigrant bodies and not as recent immigrant bodies, between skinny bodies and fat bodies. The same body-hating culture has taught us to hate and fear most other bodies in creation, wolf and coyote bodies, rodent and skunk bodies, insect bodies, spider bodies, worm bodies, fungus and bacteria and weed bodies. Instead of welcoming them as necessary beloved parts of creation, we cut ourselves off from them and or kill them off. Ew. The pandemic has heightened this fear of the other. As we have been instructed to isolate, distance ourselves, and fear even the air, the touch, the presence of others, which might carry the dreaded virus. It has also revealed the terrible divides in this country between white and black, between white and Latinx, between the well-off and the not so well-off and the poor. There are so many divisions between our bodies. The Apostle Paul wrote that Jesus came and with his flesh, with his body, brought people together who had been at odds with each other. The great divide of the New Testament times was the divide between Jews and Gentiles, which basically meant Jews and everybody else, Romans, Greek, pagans, polytheists, and so on. Jews were taught to despise Gentiles whose bodies were considered unclean and that also goes for dead bodies and menstruating women. And Gentiles were taught to hate Jews who were strange and cliquish and turned their noses up at perfectly good food. But Jesus, we are told, came to bring together both sides, not by getting them to be nicer to each other, but by reconciling them through his own body. Paul writes, Jesus is our peace in his flesh. He has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is the hostility between us, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross. Two bodies joined into one, this sounds a lot like the passage from Genesis that is often read at weddings. Adam recognizes Eve as bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife. They become one flesh. So Jew and Gentile became one flesh through the body of Jesus, like some weird divine marriage thing. How does that happen? In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus tries to take the disciples away to a quiet place to rest, but they are mobbed by Jewish people seeking them out. And Jesus has compassion on, on them. And from his body, his mouth, he fed their souls by teaching them. Later, they cross the Sea of Galilee and go among the Gentiles. They bring out all their sick so that he could heal them, and they begged to touch the fringe of his cloak and be healed. Gentiles, people whom self-respecting Jews would not touch, and they dared to reach out and touch him and be healed by his body. Wherever he went, Jesus crossed over boundary lines these artificial lines that we set up between people. He went to give people what they needed, food, teaching, healing, forgiveness, to Jews or hated Romans, to rich or poor, to clean or unclean, to tax collectors, prostitutes, self-righteous people. And when both Jewish religious leaders and Gentile political leaders conspire to kill him, 
Jesus comes back with a message to all in his resurrected body. No matter what you do to me and to God, we will still love you. In his body, all are united in love. Right now, one of the biggest divides we have in this country is the racial divide, which has been there all along, and maybe now, though, we're beginning to really see it. This divide, really, between whites and everybody else. In his excellent book, My Grandmother's Hands, social worker and trauma therapist Resma Menachem makes the link between body trauma and racism. What is that connection? A very extreme example of this comes from the story of Shannon Martinez through Yes! Magazine. When she was 14, she went to a party and was forced into sex by two 20-something white men. Martinez didn't have words for her experience for about a decade when she finally realized that she had been raped. But her body knew that she had been violated and traumatized, and that experience boiled up in her into a burning rage and self-loathing. She started hanging out with the angriest people she could find, neo-Nazis. Their worldview allowed her to channel her anger and to blame other people, Jews, gays, blacks, and to feel righteous as she carried out acts of violence against them. It was like an addiction. It was an outlet for the trauma that she could not face. Eventually, eventually she did face it. And then Martinez found her life's work in helping people transition out of extremist white supremacy groups. That means she helps them deal with the trauma that made extremism so attractive in the first place. Because in every case she has found, the people she works with have experienced trauma or deep unmet needs. Now, Shannon's experience is not the experience of the majority of white people, but Resma Menachem says, we live in a culture of white body supremacy, where white bodies are valued and black and brown bodies are devalued, feared, and hated. It's all around us, which is why most white people don't recognize it, because we think it's normal and it benefits us. But why is it that white-bodied police keep shooting and killing unarmed black bodies? It's not because they're all bad people. Why is it that otherwise open-minded white people have an automatic fear response to seeing black men walk down the sidewalk or drive by or do anything? Menachem says that white-bodied supremacy culture is everywhere. It's the air we breathe. And it has traumatized all of our bodies, black bodies and brown bodies, indigenous bodies and white bodies, and police bodies too. We have been conditioned to react negatively to other bodies, black and brown bodies, and to blame them for our unhappiness, to blame them for their own difficulties, which our white culture has caused. Some of the trauma is unprocessed pain that our ancestors went through, poverty, violence, persecution, hunger, leaving family and land to come to this land. Some of it comes from our country's history which was found on unintentional and intentional genocide of indigenous people, cultural erasure and stolen land, enslaving people to work the land and serve the economy, and causing violence to keep these people in their place. 
This trauma is passed down from generation to generation, an embodied history of violence and shame that we hardly dare to acknowledge. Most of us don't really know our family histories, and very few of us know our real American history. But I can assure you it is full of trauma. Menachem says we can't think our way out of racism because it is deeply embedded in our bodies. We have to face our internalized traumas instead of inflicting them on other bodies, which is what happens if you don't process it. You just keep putting it on other people, causing violence and harm. He says we have to live through the clean pain, clean pain of learning to face the truth, of getting grounded in our bodies, of retraining our responses to others and to trauma and allowing ourselves to be healed. It is a long and difficult process, but it is possible. After her parents kicked her out, Shannon Martinez ended up moving in with her boyfriend's mother, Carol Selby. By that time, Martinez saw herself as a hot mess of a human being. But Selby saw in her something else, not a vile skinhead, but a cute little elf. Given love, respect, and space, Mar Martinez started coming out of her self-loathing. She started doing chores around the house and taking care of Selby's younger sons. Within a few months, she left behind the neo-Nazi ideology. Because Selby embodied Jesus' love and acceptance and opened the door to start healing the trauma that Martinez had been going through. Now, after long and hard work on her own trauma, Martinez has taken on the anti-radicalization work for others. It is long, exhausting work, mostly unpaid, but it is transformative because she bridges the gap. She helps people deal with their trauma. She helps bring bodies together. Jesus was a body. Jesus came to remind us that we are beloved bodies, always valued, always able to be healed and to heal others. We did not cause the traumas that we have suffered or inherited, but we are responsible to address them and to move forward and be agents of healing across the divides. How do we start? Maybe many of you have started the work of becoming an anti-racist. I suggest that you read Menachem's book, Better yet, read it together with others and do the body practices together. It's, it's about our bodies. It's about practicing. Incorporate prayer with it because it is difficult work. Invite the body Jesus into your practice, his healing, his touch, his forgiveness, his transformation. He has the power to do what we ourselves cannot do. So if you will humor me, I invite you to do a little body practice just to get a taste of it. Nothing difficult. So I invite you to sit comfortably with your feet on the ground if you're able. Feel supported by the chair behind your back, the bench underneath, and the ground under your feet. If you feel comfortable, close your eyes. Now take three long breaths in and out. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in 
and breathe out. Allow your body to relax. Pay attention to your body. Hello, body. How are you? Where does your body feel relaxed and comfortable? Where might your body feel tension, constriction, or pain? Feeling your body may be an easy thing for you or it might be difficult. There is no judgment. See if you can breathe into the tension or pain a little bit. See if you can relax a little bit more. Do you carry fear in your body? Where is that located in your body? Is it in your chest, your neck, your guts? What does it feel like? Do you carry love in your body? Where does that reside? What does it feel like? You probably carry both fear and love in places in your body. And return to your breath. Be aware of breathing in and breathing out. Your body is the home of God. Christ is here within you within your very cells. Christ is the love that resides in you. Thank God, thank Christ for being here within you. Christ is also here in your body in the places of pain and fear. Invite him to be here with you in these places. Invite him to hold them and open them to his healing touch. Gently take one more breath in and out and return to the present and open your eyes. Christ came to bind our bodies together in, our, in himself, all of our bodies. And it begins with your body and my body. The more we practice becoming aware of our bodies, the more we are able to process trauma, the more we rely on Jesus for healing and courage, the more we can move towards healing our very divided world. Let us pray. Most gracious God, creator of all bodies and inhabitor of all bodies, we thank you that you are present in us, in other people's bodies, in all the bodies in creation, even the ones we fear or loathe, you are present. Help us to value our body, to become very, very connected to it. Help us to face our trauma, personal, intergenerational, historical, Help us to invite in your healing. Help us to become whole people 
powerful anti-racists, powerful reconcilers. Be the reconciler in us and through us of your precious world. In the name of Jesus, your son, your body, we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able to say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him, for our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven as seated at the right hand of the Father. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite you to sit or kneel as you are able and to offer your prayers either silently, aloud, or using the chat function on Facebook. We pray for Iglise Aglican de Rwanda, Michael, our presiding bishop, Alan and all of our bishops, Amy, dean of our cathedral, Carol, our regional canon, Nick, our priest, and Lisa, our visiting priest. Also, our companion parish at St. Luke's in Lazile, Haiti, and our siblings at the Mana community in Boston. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. We pray for the parishes of Mystic Valley Deanery, St. Paul's Church Linfield, St. Paul's Church Malden, Grace Church Medford, Trinity Parish Melrose, and deputies and alternate deputies to the General Convention. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for the Good Shepherd Christian Fellowship and Congregation Ruach Israel. We pray for all bishops, priests, deacons, and lay ministers. The faithful ministers to the Word and Sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Incline our hearts to rejoice in your goodness. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. We pray for Harry and Jeanette, Mark, Andy M, Alex, Penny, Maya, 
Ed B, Glenn, Madison, Aunt Anita, Kate, Jim and Debbie, Lois C, Sarah, Gail, Thomas, Maureen, Linda F. And we pray for all those serving our country, especially remembering Timmy, Tom Z, Emmy, Jack, Sean, Ian, Colin, Tim, and Andrew. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Especially remembering our brother Bob Fowler. We pray for all the departed. Give to them eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will and those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask. Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have loved, not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let us share the peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Also with you. Please be seated. For uh, so, I'm I'm here again. Um, my name is Lisa Hildebrandt. I come to you from Arlington. I'm very happy to be spent spending four Sundays with you all, as your rector is on vacation. Um, a few announcements there in your bulletin. Um, the office will be closed on Wednesday and Thursday this week. Um, Still 12 grocery bags are needed for Be Safe in July, so the d details are in the bulletin insert. Um, Bible study coming up, and the MANA lunch program needs help, so if you are interested, please follow up. Are there any other announcements that the community needs to hear about? Okay, we will um, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Our service continues with the, the uh, Great Thanksgiving Eucharistic Prayer A. Please stand if you are comfortable doing so. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. You have filled us and, with all, and all creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body. Through your spirit, you replenish us and call us to the fullness of life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all crea creation as we say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious God, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died and lives for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. say together the post-communion prayer. Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, the one, the holy, and undivided Trinity, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. 
The final hymn is number 423 in the hymnal. Let us go forth, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thank you. 